Hello, I'm the Dark Master, and welcome back to the Kirby Right Back Atchum Retrospective. This time we'll be covering Episode 4, A Dark and Stormy Night. Or as it's known in the original Japanese anime, The Secret of the Star Warrior! we start, this is the first episode where the YouTube upload was split into multiple parts. This was a common tactic in the early YouTube days, circa the site's founding, till about 2013. Of course, this has become pretty much meaningless, as you can be hit for like 30 seconds, even 10 seconds of audio if the copyright holders deciding to be extra douchebaggish. Yes, I'm looking at you, YouTube, and I see all the yellow things you give me, even though I literally don't monetize any of my videos, so I don't even know why you bother. In essence, what I'm trying to say is that please let me know if the video quality has been downgraded. If possible, link a better video alternative. Also, before we finish, this is kind of an edit after the fact. I managed to find a higher quality video to put in the description, but by that time I've already like, you know, edited this entire video and I can't really go back and change it. Oops. Anyway, the episode opens to Castle Dedede with the king and his court arguing. You see, Dedede has some justified beliefs that Tiff is helping Kirby and is hiding stuff from him. Sir Ibram tries to calm the king's anger towards his daughter down. Ladylike, unfortunately, is for some reason undermining his attempts with her sniveling remarks that only make the DDD more angry. Anyway, the king and Escargoon accuse Tiff of being a traitor. This understandably makes her brother Tuff rather angry over the false accusation, as those can often ruin someone's life. And he demands proof. DDD laughs and shows off a collection of photos he took that showed Kirby and Tiff together. Though I have to ask, how the heck did he get this angle? Did he use like a drone? Was there a Waddle D perched up somewhere? I mean, this is like very oddly posed. Like it's like it's above where Kirby's standing, looking down. But like, I'm pretty sure that Kirby was in the highest part of the building. Regardless, it is a rather damning photograph that has tough in it, as well as showcasing Kirby beating the monster. Then we're treated to a flashback, which is kind of cool, but as I said in the last retrospective of episode 3, Kirby's Dual World, these flashbacks could have used maybe some blurring at the edges for a more visual originality. Also, this other photograph is even more improbably shot. Like, seriously, how did he get that close? Did he zoom in? Did, like, like these, these photos are absurdly well done, so I can understand the people being skeptical. Anyway, DDD demands an explanation. That Kirby is very <laughs> photogenic. <laughs> did you use a digital camera, sire? Okay, well, good to know Lady Like doesn't care just about her own beauty, but still, what a freaking weird statement to make. Also, Sir Ibram, that is definitely not the work of a digital camera. Digital cameras don't 
print physical copies of the photographs they take. Also, they don't really do that style of black and white. I mean, they have filters, but it's not quite the same. You can usually tell when it's a filter as opposed to the real thing. Annoyed at the trivialities, King Dedede tells them to listen and warns both Tiff and Tuff that he knows Kirby is stuck on Popstar due to the loss of his ship. Again, I'd like to point out Dedede knows this, yet still shot down Kirby. I mean, and still hasn't returned the ship. It's like Stockholm Syndrome. It's so hard for me to think King Dedede actually hates Kirby. It's really a love-hate relationship. Like, if you really hated him, why'd you shoot him down? You could have just let him leave. And why aren't you currently trying to help him make the ship so he can leave your planet? After the intro, we cut back to King Dedede waddling to his throne using this recycled footage. Tells us that the king means business. As unlike the previous episodes, he immediately goes to order another monster. Vowing to earn the kid's respect, he gets a call with the enemy sales guy. Now, exactly why he suddenly wants the kid's respect is beyond me. It, this is just a really one-time thing. He doesn't really try and get respect much later in the series. The sale guy greets the king, but is cut off by the impatient DD ordering a new monster that can beat Kirby in a flash, to which the enemy guy tells him that they just happened to get a brand new monster in stock, that being the famous boss character, Krako, dating all the way back to Kirby's Dreamland. Normally I would go over said monster immediately, but I think I'll wait this time, as we're going to only see him in person in the end of the episode. Also, can I just say, the English dub's conversation between these two in most episodes is so much more electrifying than the original Japanese. I don't know why, but the original had a much more bland and just upfront lines, and really lacked a certain spark, if you will. Just look at these two scenes compared. Well, what a shocking coincidence, sire. We happen to have a brand new monster that's absolutely electrifying. It's a huge thunderstorm monster called Krako. Krako? All right. You're gonna love it, King. And this the salesman then explains to the king that due to the sheer size of Krako, they will have to deliver it by air. But since Enemy is not based on Popstar, wouldn't it technically be delivered by space? Also, I have to question how big Krako really is, but I'll save that to when we actually see him. As they talk, we open to see Sir Meta Knight was eavesdropping on the conversation. He is greeted by Tuff, who also says hello as he was walking down the hall, to which Meta Knight answers. Knight, how's it going? Very badly. This, of course, prompts Tuff to run back after him, wanting more answers. Before we could ask a single question, Meta Knight asks him where Tiff is, to which Tuff answers, she went to see Kirby. He then asks why it matters, to which Meta Knight answers, they are both in danger. Tuff is, of course, also concerned. Then we cut to Kirby's house, where we see Takori once again taking advantage of an innocent child, forcing a literal baby to make up his bed. The bed itself is even taller than him. Horrid bird. Luckily, Tiff arrives to put an end to all this and calls the bird out on it. Decoy, of course, claims that he's just helping Kirby learn. Of course, Kirby tries his best to fluff the pillow, but then falls over due to his body shape. Tiff calls Kirby outside, to which the happy puffball agrees to. Unfortunately, Decoy also leaves, interrupting Tiff, telling Kirby of all the injustice this has done to him. Takori says that Tiff is putting funny ideas into Kirby's head, which is like, you know, kind of weird. He's not really doing that. Also, some people have told me that Takori's Japanese voice done by Fugiko Takemoto is not annoying. 
Now, while I will say it is less annoying, it's still high-pitched and annoying to me. Apparently, he was in this Naruto movie, and that's where a lot of defense comes from. But but on his own, he's not really that good of an actor in this instance. I'm sorry. Tiff is, of course, having none of it, so tells Tokori to go inside. Scared, he does so. Kirby, being the simpleton he is, also tries to go in, but Tiff stops him. She pleads with Kirby to tell her more about himself, but Kirby, being a baby, doesn't understand her at all. Suddenly, a dragonfly perches on Tiff's head. He can tell because its wings are held open while damselflies hold their wings closed. Kirby then childishly tackles Tiff, trying to catch the dragonfly, who laughs and flies away. Another rather random animal, similar to that lizard in episode 2. Tiff then sighs, seeing that the conversation is going nowhere. Well, he is a baby, like genuinely a Star Wars baby. You shouldn't really expect him to possess deep dialogue. This is cut short by the arrival of a large storm. Well, the weather is unpredictable, I should know. What is odd is that a bolt almost hits Tiff and Kirby instead of hitting the tree. Instead of entering Kirby's home, the rational decision, perhaps to Cory lock the door, it would be well within his douchebag nature. Another bolt of lightning strikes almost hitting them. The pair then run, trying to avoid the lightning. Kirby trips upon a rather large tree root, and the lightning bolt hits the tree, causing it to explode. And can I just say, Kirby's yell is just funny. <laughs> Tiff turns to see the explosion and rushes to get Kirby out of the water because we all know what happens when you mix the two. With crossed out eyes, the KO'd Kirby is pulled by Tiff away. Then the storm does well some odd lightning. Firstly, this has to be some of the slowest lightning ever, as young children outlast it for a while. Longer in the original anime, as the dub does for some reason slightly speed up the footage. Which kind of makes sense, the original anime was a bit slow, and the music didn't really help matters. Also, the lightning goes for a long time horizontally above the ground, even though the ground literally attracts lightning in real life. Tiff gets suspicious about this, though in the original anime she just knows it's a, a demon beast somehow. I mean, like, it is kind of weird that she just automatically knows it's a demon beast. Then we cut to Capitan, where Tiff and Kirby are running to. We see Mayor Blustergas and his wife having a lovely drive in their car. Speaking of, the technology in this world is really inconsistent. Like, they have the internet, but there's also a car from like the 1900s. At least it has a cool Cappy hood ornament. They see the running pair, but are too slow to get out the way. Of course, really lightning should have been drawn into the rubber tires as opposed to just hitting the entire car. But then again, it does have an open Cassie, so that might be impacting things. Also, I just love how it's able to like completely destroy the car, but like the people are still alive. That's just impressive. Next, Tiff and Kirby run to Chef Kawasaki's restaurant. They fail to close the door behind them, which could have easily nullified the lightning with its solid frame. As such, the lightning electrocutes Kawasaki, but this voice actor really makes him not feel like he's in pain. The Japanese voice is actually better in this instance. Good job, Nobur Iobita. I'll find a comparison between these two scenes right now. <laughs> From there, we turn to the sole new character of the episode outside of, you know, the monster of the week, Krakow. Mabel. No, not that one. This is the debut of... Meberu, as she's called in Japan. Not the Fofa factor, as the Wikipedia of Kirby says. They really gotta fix that. She's the local clairvoyant and fortune teller of the village. Though there's more to it than that, but she does get a few episodes of her own. So let's save the more in-depth opinion of her there. 
She's the love ventures to Samo, the barman, and is voiced by Lisa Ortez, who does a decent job in the voice acting. Though it is a pretty short scene, so we don't really get to see much of it. And it just has her observing Kawasaki is plight through her orb, only to get shocked herself. Rightfully so, after the horrid pun. Shocking event. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that sound? That was an odd yell. Anyway, then we get to see Professor Curio, who has recently reconstructed a species of extinct animal. What he des describes as a Triceratops capriosus. Okay, so as a paleo guy, let me critique this for a moment. Firstly, there is no way that a actual Triceratops, that is an Earth-based genus, happened to be on Popstar in the... That's just a possibility. And plus, the mathematical chances of something this similar to a Earth life form, especially in the skeletal department, is indescribably small. So as such, I think it's fair to say that some ancient aliens might have transplanted these creatures here. Just the other alternative is just so mathematically minuscule as to be impossible. Even with that in mind, the distinctive nostrils, odd frill-shaped, and abnormally bendy tail suggests that this is a full-on separate genus from Triceratops, which may very well be descended from them, if my ancient aliens hypothesis is correct. Even the original anime notes this, dubbing it the Kira Kira Tops. Kira Kira being the Japanese word for sparkling. Though it should really be Kira Kira Ceratops, if it's to be proper Latin. Though it's really not all that sparkling of a horned face. I would have given it a better name, like Capi Ceratops or something like that. I don't know. Sorry for this brief aside. I just think it's kind of interesting how the Xeno biology is kind of messy. Man, your display stand is weak as heck if that causes it to fall down. We also then see Chief Bookums making Doro Ron aware of the DA, who we never see, by the way. There's, in fact, several institutions of Cappies that we never see in the anime. Decision to lay on more charges. Is there more towns of Cappies? Anyway, he's electrocuted and... We are then provided with a wide shot of the entire town being pelted by lightning bolts cast down by Krakow. This might seem like a generic landscape shot, but it's actually an obscure parody slash homage to the obscure 1958 science fiction horror B-movie, The Trollenberg Terror, a guild film of its type, to be sure, though it's odd that Kirby is more terrifying than that film's monster, if you really think about it. We then cut to Tiff's wondering the wasted Cappy Town, looking for Kirby, who she got separated from. Tuff also arrives, asking where Kirby is. Before Tiff can fully explain, she is interrupted by the arrival of DDD and Escargoon in their truck. They almost run over the pair as they go watch Krakow try to kill Kirby. Hey, look up ahead! That's Kirby! Let's watch this. Why not? I got nothing better to do. Ask Argoon, I know how you feel. Man, that feeling has been so relevant for a while since this lockdown started. Anyway, the two buffoons laugh until Kirby starts getting closer and runs around. Knowing that the lightning could easily strike them, they try to get Kirby to scram, only to end up shocked as Kirby jumps on board and hides inside a specific department. Surprisingly, their vehicle actually survives the blast, and the king drives off, apparently not noticing Kirby is in the car with him. This shocking betrayal has the king try to escape to the castle. He soars to the opening drawbridge, but somehow the lightning causes him to not only go flying, but break the drawbridge underneath him as he you know, falls into it. Now, not the tank breaking the bridge. No, it's the lightning. Literally, look at that. Though I would say that DDD falling into the bridge probably didn't help matters. 
Plunging into the moat, the two emerge from the water, as does Kirby, prompting Krakow to strike the water. That combined with the truck's metal exterior shocks Deity and Escargoon, as Kirby somehow avoids that, running as fast as humanly possible into the distance. Man, Kirby's really fast when he puts his mind to it. The, when the annoyed king arrives and gets into a call with the sales guy, he assures the king that Krakow will get the job done. But DDD, who is rather lucky just to have a mild cold slash fever from being literally electrocuted once... Krakow! Gone. To which the sale guy simply states that <laughs> Sorry, Your Majesty, but our contract states that Cracko can't be sent back -o. You know, Dee Dee, you should have listened to the theme song intro. Escargoon told you to make sure it comes back with a money back guarantee. Dee Dee tries to call him out on their pre order B level BS, but fails. In the Japanese version, the sales guy is more reasonable and says that. There's an hour-long cooling-off period in the contract. Amazing to think that it's been less than an hour since this episode really, you know, took off. Meanwhile, the storm grows larger, with the Cappy Town citizens looking to the sky concerned. Lolo and Alala join in Tiff and Tuff's search for Kirby. It's revealed the utter destruction of Krakow and Kirby is indeed hiding beneath a bridge, utterly terrified. I mean, look at the shutter. I mean, I would be terrified, too, if there's a lightning monster. Tuff fails to find Kirby, and as such, informs Tiff of his failure. Tiff, understanding Krakow's superiority in the air and empathy for Kirby's fear, realizes that, this is that Kirby needs something to help him, that being the Warp Star. She tells the rest of the gang to continue looking for Kirby as she leaves to go to Kabu. She is about to ask him for something, but is then cut off by him saying they are not alone. And by gosh, that is clearly just a JPEG sitting there, slightly altered to be diagonally angled. Man, that is that's just easy. It turns out Meta Knight had entered the shrine beneath Kabu which Tiff reveals that she had put the Warp Star there after the battle with Octagon, of course. Tiff accidentally refers to Blocky in the um, anime, in both versions, so that was most likely a continuity error, as the Warp Star was not used against Blocky. Also in the sequence, there is some of the best dialogue. Seriously, what kind of non-answer is this? Just how much do you know? About Kirby. Much, perhaps, or perhaps very little. Then we cut to Kirby still hiding from the storm. Tuff and the gang are still looking for him. Making a break for it, Kirby hides in a hole to avoid the attack. Tiff yells out. Then we quickly go back to the conversation that Meta Knight and Tiff are having. Meta Knight then reveals what we, the audience, already know. That the clouds are in fact not a regular storm, but are a monster ordered by King DDD. Tiff stomps her foot in a scene that is for some reason cut out in the American dub. Is stomping feet too violent for children? Here's that cut scene. In the American dub, they change is much more abrupt from scenes, and it's just kind of weird. I find it weird that they cut that out. Really didn't need to. So Meta Knight explains that Deity is jealous and mistrusting of Kirby and is ordering monsters to destroy him. In the Japanese cutscene, she had asked why, whereas here in the English dub, Meta just goes full into a lore dump, which is a lot more awkward. Either way, he tells that Nightmare Enterprises was founded thousands of years ago by one known as NME. Get the pun? Honestly, I prefer the name Nightmare. This is just a bad pun, in my opinion. Anyway, N-M-E. 
seeks to conquer the universe and does that by creating legions of monsters. But he was challenged by the freedom-loving armies of the Star Warriors. In addition to battleships, there were a very human-like guys, wannabe Falcos, and guys without arms, and a bunch of others, including Meta Knight. They fought horrible demon beasts like giant centipedes and nautiloids that spew electricity from their mouths and tentacles. Though I have to ask, do they all have the ability to inhale like Kirby did? I, I don't think that's the case, because if that is the case, they would have been Nightmare easily. But yeah, that's why I think Kirby was a star child, but was partially powered up by Nightmare. We even get to see Meta Knight fighting against a giant armadillo thing. In the end, despite the Star Wars bravery, Nightmare's monsters outnumber them, and eventually Meta Knight was the only one left. The sole survivor, he, injured, went to his gray starship, hoping that he was not the last warrior. Meta Knight then picks up the Warp Star and explains he hoped new warriors would come and aid him in destroying enemy. Then he explains to the confused Tiff why he works for Dedede, because he knew that Kirby's starship would be attracted by Dedede's monsters, or at least some other star child, which the petty despot would certainly order. Tiff then happy says Kirby did indeed come here. But Meta Knight explains that Kirby arrived 200 years early, and as such is barely a baby. Like, it's, it's he's confirmed to be literally a baby. Meta Knight is a bit more short than I'd expect him to be, almost as if he's being as heavy as his accent in this scene. Luckily, despite being a baby who can barely talk or speak, he has powerful innate powers. Though, one must ask, does Meta Knight have similar powers? I mean, if so, why the heck does he use only a sword? And if he did, and the other Star Wars did, why would he have lost against Nightmare? Like, I mean, like, seriously, this makes no sense. Despite that, I mean, it sure would be, like, really useful if he used the powers that he allegedly has. I mean, especially since he's, you know literally the same species as Kirby, even more so than other Star Wars. Despite that, Meta Knight is hopeful that Kirby can help him beat Nightmare despite being a baby. But let me just say, we got 96 more episodes till that happens, so you guys better be patient. Meta Knight says, while he will help Kirby, it will not be enough, and that Tiff will also have to help Kirby, as she will have to guard Kirby's warp star. You, it, you see, contains his power. He must only see it to be inspired to fight harder. And it must be guarded by someone who loves and cares for Kirby. And guess who fits the bill? Tiff. Tiff, annoyed at Meta Knight's insinuation, yeah, that she has been taking good care of it so far. But Meta Knight counters that Cracker is much more powerful than the previous monsters. And he's correct both in the anime and in the games, as Krakow is a recurring boss, whereas the previous three were either anime exclusive until recently, or mini-bosses. Meta Knight then muses on whether or not, even with the Warp Star, Kirby is strong enough to stop Krakow. Then we return to Kirby, where Tuff tells Kirby to inhale or at the very least attempt to inhale Krako. Now this may contradict what I said in the last retrospective where like they weren't inhaling it needlessly but understand Tuff is really only doing this to like be supportive. Lolo also chimes in with Tuff's encouragement nods. Kirby leaps out and goes to try to inhale Krako. It goes about as well as you think aka poorly. Krako starts sending forth lightning as Kirby dodges. Man, this lightning is either really slow or Kirby's just very fast. But then again, Kirby is, like, way faster than Tiff. I mean, look how fast he ran when, like, there was the electrocution in the moat. But seriously, this is some slow lightning. Anyway, but then King Dedede and Escargoon show up. 
and pursue the pink puffball. Kirby then does a sweet dodge, and there is a motor accident, and the destruction of what appears to be either someone's house or ancient ruins. Tiff then arrives to see the scene and speaks slash plays to Taboo to release the warp style. He does so, I guess sensing her need, and releases the full-sized warp style while saying, Warp Star, and it flies to Kirby's location. Kirby sees it and grabs it, going into the storm. Meta Knight congratulates Tiff's achievements, but she remains worried as we see Kirby enter the eye of the storm. And well, let's just say he leaves a lot to be desired. Yes, I must state, this is the true form of Krakow. And yes, he's pretty accurate to his appearance at the time, with a few extra pairs of spikes in the center. And as you can see, when we see Krakow's true form, he's really not that big. At least not big enough to warrant the shipment by air. At least uh, without the storm like if it can, if Krako must arrive in a storm cloud maybe that justifies it but really i think the sales guy was just trying to be mean to the king he's also one of only four actual bosses used as monsters in the anime excluding nightmare obviously there was the ice dragon which we'll see relatively soon paint roller and heavy lobster which, by the way, we won't see until nearly the very end of the anime. Kirby flies around, and Krakow follows him with his eye, and s strikes lightning at him. After a few successful dodges, Kirby gets zapped, causing Kirby to be knocked out, much to the shock of Tiff and the gang, as he flies slash falls out of the hole. Luckily, the Warp Star catches Kirby. Oh no! <gasps> Krakow shoots all bolt of lightning that Kirby dodges and barely misses his friends. Angered at this attack upon his friends, Kirby starts to suck up Krakow's cover. This eventually reveals the beast and literally starts to inhale Krakow towards him. You can see the beast even try to fight it. I'm pretty sure it's caught off guard. I mean, I've been, it is kind of creepy to be almost inhaled by Kirby. Eventually, Krakow is revealed to all once Kirby inhales the cloud cover and spits it right back out at him. This causes him to use lightning in a manner not seen in the games. Now, normally this would be fine. Actually... I'll be frank, Krakow in the games was always kind of a joke, even among the more recent games where he's gotten newer attacks. But yeah, especially in the games released at the time, that he was a joke, really. Like, he was never that hard. So the fact that they decided to add Look, it's new moves for the anime, I understand. It's not something I'm going to get angry about. Now dealing with both a lightning sword and lightning, Kirby tries to of lighten his load by eating the lightning sword. And uh, this is what happens, and this is why this is partially a flaw with the anime episode. Okay, so this is a big issue I and many others have with the episode, even if I like the transformation. You see... Lightning should have given him spark, like instead of sword. That would have been way more original, plus it wouldn't have resulted in reusing the abilities so soon. And in fact, spark is indeed in the anime, just at a much later point. And I know there's a hundred episodes, so they clearly had to reuse some abilities. But I don't know, I think they could have avoided reusing the abilities just a bit longer. Definitely, they would have had to use it more often in later 
episode definitely, but really, I think this was the wrong episode to begin reusing it. Sword Kirby fights Cracker, reflecting and dodging lightning. Dee Dee emerges from the rubble, and can I say his chant is pretty cool and pretty funny out of context? I don't know why. Go Cracko! Go Cracko! Go Cracko! Kirby finally lands a hit with Krako, though due to hitting the cloud, it seems to have not been Fado. Also, they kept the Japanese voice acting for some odd reason. I guess it's because since it's not an actual word, it doesn't like sound that off. It just sounds like a weird cry. Kirby keeps slashing, causing Krako to groan in ever more pain, which you can really tell in his voice, like just listen to it. Kirby finally puts the beast down by slicing his body in half, understandably causing Krakow's explosive death. The storm recedes and all except DDD and this computer crack, crack, oh, And once again the episode ends in a pun. This becomes a trend in the series. Kirby, just let me know when you need the star treatment. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, that pun was pretty painful. Anyway, so how is this episode overall? Personally, I think it's cool to have an episode where the threat is around nearly in the entire time. Kirby really doesn't have that often in the anime. I mean, usually the demon beast is sort of just a late stage third act arrival, while here, Krakow is pretty much there through the entire time. And I think it's really cool because he's a boss. He's literally a boss in the video games, and it's nice to see him pretty much get a lot more attention than some of the other previous monsters. The reuse of sword, though, is a big detriment, and I have to say that does weaken the episode overall. Also, there's like this lore dump with Meta Knight, which I personally like, but some people have issues with it. However, there are some criticisms that I think are not valid. You see, some people say Meta Knight should not have been knowledgeable about this like he, he shouldn't know and um i have to say firstly it's implied that meta knight was a long time star warrior so it's likely he could have seen other star warriors arrive second i mean you don't need to know someone's entire life history to know the fact that someone was at one time a baby and especially since it is likely his own starship was attracted due to monsters I don't know, this isn't as unreasonable as some people try and paint it out to be. I mean, really, it's not that unreasonable. And I don't know why it's like this big controversy. Anyway, I'm the Dark Master, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider subscribing to join me next time on the Kirby Right Back at Ya Retrospective. <laughs>